My name is Sarah Geis. I'm 26 years old. Today is May 5th, 2008, and I'm in Sacramento, California with Cherie. My name is Cherie Nelson. I'm 48. We are in Sacramento, California on May the 5th, 2008. All right, so um, Cherie, we just met on this beautiful, sunny spring in California day, um, and I don't know much about you at all. So tell me, um, where did you grow up? Well, I was born in St. Helena, California, which is the wine country, heart of the wine country, and my family was of the Adventist faith, so we didn't believe in drinking, so oddly enough, we... <laughs> We're living there, but uh, we didn't partake of that particular fine resource. And we moved from Napa to Portland, and at that time my grandparents had a farm in Tillamook, Oregon, which is a well-known cheese-producing region. And I went and spent time on my grandparents' farm. I was nine when I went. And it was for the summer, for some reason um, that has never been totally explained to me, it was decided that I would remain there for the whole school year. So I was just a very strong, capable kid, and I helped my grandparents, helped milk the cows, go get the cows, feed them, loved feeding the baby calves. They were just lovely, and I learned how to do gardening. My grandmother had a very big garden, lots of vegetables and raspberries, blackberries grew in abundance, and one particular incident that happened is um, there was a creek that ran through the property and it was a really charming place. Lots of stones and just kind of shady and peaceful. And there was a bridge that went over the main road, went over where the bridge crossed and there was a rail that was approximately probably 14 inches wide, and I was going across the creek to my grand, other grand, my great-grandfather's house, and the most direct route was to go on the road, and when I got to the bridge, I just jumped up on the rail and walked across, and there was about a 30-foot drop down to the creek, the running water, and um, I had a, a bit of a perception of danger However, I just kept walking, and I did that every day. And one day, my grandmother and mother were at the kitchen sink and were able to view this particular activity. They were horrified. I was walking across the bridge. To me, it was just a routine thing, so they, they counseled me not to do that anymore. Did you stop? I did stop. And... I just remember that time as a time of a lot of hard work, and I had a realization that I didn't want to be a farmer. It, it's so much work. It's more than being married because you have to be there to milk the cows twice a day. To even do a family reunion, it was an incredible ordeal to, to get away for just a few hours. However, my grandmother was the most amazing woman. She was the youngest of 12 children. And there's a theory out there that the youngest child is the most fun, and it's certainly true in our family. I'm the oldest, and I'm way too serious and responsible, and my youngest sister is everyone's favorite, and she's lots of fun. And my grandmother, oh, she could make me laugh until my cheeks would ache. She just had this amazing quality about her. And I'm so lucky that I got to spend time with her. And all of that laughter and how great it made me feel, 
has helped me in parenting my daughter that um, is now eight. And so I always try to have a little touchstone of humor that, um, that helps us end our day. What are some of the ways you do that? Well, somewhere along the line, I made the determination that it would be a good idea to have a routine for bedtime. <clears throat> so for some reason, a bath never stuck with my child, Clarissa. However, she uh, will accept being read to a song, a prayer, and then kiss, kiss, good night. And so a, a classic example is, well, right now we are reading the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, and she reads a couple pages, then I read a couple, we alternate. And I'm so proud of the way she can read. That's just... It makes my heart swell with pride when I can see how much she has progressed in such a short time. And so once that's done, then it's time for a song. And so I'll ask her, what time is it now? And she says, it's time for a song. And I said, well, just as a sidebar, so you'll know, what her favorite song is, and she invariably asked for is, I love you a bushel and a peck. However, to put, play the game, I'll say, well, out of dozens of songs, what will it be tonight? Could it be on the street where you live? I love you truly. She'll say, mama, I just want, I love you a bushel and a peck. And I'll say, oh, and act surprised that she giggles and her face lights up. It's just beautiful. So that's part of our routine. And then we'll, I'll sing that. It just must calm her down. And then we, sing, we say the Lord's Prayer in call and response. So our Father, and then she says, who art in heaven. And we say it back and forth. And it's just a beautiful way to end our day. And often then we'll say a prayer that's personalized and that's about the events of the day. And that's, that's what works for us. Wow, that's beautiful. So um, prayer is important in your life. Do you want to just go backwards, talk about your religious upbringing? How, how... Well, I was raised Adventist and... I was pretty involved with the church uh, as a kid, and then, and and by that I mean my sisters and I, the two others, there were three of us. We were encouraged by my mother to learn to sing, and we sang as a trio in the church. And my other two sisters are incredibly talented. Both of them are very competent vocalists and my youngest sister is actually a professional vocal quality vocalist composer and musician my other sister is the kind of person that goes to karaoke and blows everyone else away <laughs> but we and i could never really sing the harmonies i could only sing lead they were the harmonizers and then as I was in high school, I was involved with groups that would go around and put on the worship services for smaller churches. And at some point, I must say, I became rather disillusioned with uh, the faith. I, I could see hypocrisy, and I, I just moved away from the church. And then I got married and moved to Sacramento in 1982. And my husband, Charles, was, I'm not sure if he was really an atheist, but we didn't really have a, a spiritual life or we didn't attend any services. However, when my son was born in 1989, 
he was such a gift to me in that it made me mature and grow up and um, of course that happens over a period of time but at the time that he came home with me so he must have only been a day or two old he was there on the pillow in front of me just so little and perfect yet just beautiful and I had this awareness that I couldn't have done that. There was a, a power greater than myself at work to make that perfect being come into existence. And so that was really when I believe I started on a more mature spiritual journey. And, and not that... I wasn't spiritual before. I think it kind of goes underground for uh, a while. And after I I had him, I attempted to go to church a few times and he was a pretty busy boy and it just never really stuck with him. Yet I I did I was I think the seeds were planted and I have friends that were from back east that came out visiting and my friend Kathleen had a hotel right near the Union Square in San Francisco and a couple of girlfriends and I were staying there with her and doing everything in the city that we could do in a weekend and at the bedside there was a, a drawer in the in the bedside table and I pulled it out and there was a book of Buddha so instead of Gideon's Bible it was the book of Buddha and I presume that's because we were in the middle of San Francisco an international destination so I picked it up and to just give a bit of perspective when you grow up in the Adventist faith and and perhaps any faith that promotes a rather exclusive view, the other religions are at times looked down upon. And so I almost felt like I was doing something forbidden by opening up the Book of Buddha, but I did it anyway. And it flipped open to a section that said, honor your mother and father, don't steal, do not kill. And I just went, wow this is the same kind of thing that the Ten Commandments say and I thought there's not that much difference there there's something that is very uh, common in it's it's in common with the beliefs of Christianity and so I was my heart was opened I believe to be more receptive to other philosophies as I continued in life and so now I have a beautiful daughter and uh, she when she was three her father and I separated and I started going to the Methodist Church which is at 21st and J Street I was attracted to it because it has a pipe organ it has a bit more traditional music and services there and people were very friendly even though I was a single parent um, and they have children's program and I thought I would like to have her have some knowledge of of spiritual matters and that seemed a good way to let that happen at the same time I still do really value some of the Buddhist um, ideas and I love the book um, pieces every up by Thich Nhat Hanh and I really like the concepts in the Tao as well and so I'm not sure how it's all going to work out for her but it's working out well for me. <laughs> so you have um, two kids you have a boy who's 18 what's his name? Trevor. Trevor and then Clarissa who is eight. Mm -hmm. how, um, how are you a different parent? How are you um, what did you do differently with the two kids? There's such an age difference. Well, that's a great question. I believe I'm a much calmer parent 
at the second time. I was 30 when I had Trevor and 40 when I had Clarissa. And I am so blessed because I was healthy and able to take care of them, and they were also very healthy. They also, I did have one thing in common with both of them. I chose to nurse both of them, and neither child ever had one ounce of formula, which I'm so proud of. With my son, I was at home with him. With my daughter, I returned to work at about when she was about four months, and fortunately, I work at a place where I was able to pump and and have that to give to the daycare where she was cared for, and they really supported our decision. And both of those, both of my children are so healthy, and I don't know if it's because of that, but. With Trevor, I believe I was a, more nervous and worried about whether he was going to fall down or whether he was going to hurt himself. At the same time, I, I had the philosophy that if they did fall down, don't go, <gasps> just wait and see what happens. And otherwise, they might try and cry just to get your reaction and I've treated both of them similarly in that respect my daughter Clarissa I'm still learning how to parent I believe it's going to be an ongoing project and she's a very bright child so I have to do the best I can um, I'm taking parenting with love and logic <laughs> at our church. I'm learning as much as I can because I I want to be a good role model for her so she'll have a better chance. Yeah. Can you describe each of them, just how they are now? Trevor is really tall and ultra handsome. He has a kind of dark curly hair has a beautiful chiseled nose and really um, nice eyes. He is super into paintball, like the PP. Oh boy. He's gonna kill me for not remembering this. It's the Professional Paintball, National, NPPL, National Professional Paintball League. Wow. And he is so into it in order to become a better player he goes to the gym and he works out and he is in such great shape he also is really talented at music he plays the uh, string bass the bass guitar and guitar and he sings he surprises me with when i'm talking to him on the phone he will play a little lick on the on the guitar and see what I think and it's it's always really amazing and last year we had the opportunity of attending one of his events at the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds and my mom his grandma and my child Clarissa and I attended and these paintballers look like aliens almost they have these costumes that are just like so black but splattered up and you can't even recognize them hardly when they have these headbands and these eye protectors and they are the nicest kids though they're very straightforward they they are really good kids so I had a very enlightening time there, and my son's team kept staying in the running. They kept doing well, and it got right up to the last of the day, and he went in there, and I have to say, it happened so quickly that he it's hard to tell what's going on. I think you need to be over the whole field to see, because they're running, and they're tumbling, and my son has really, really fast footwork, and he 
managed to uh, help get their team all the way to the first place. It w they won the championship last year. I think it was in June. And my daughter was there, and what she was doing is she was going around picking up all the unused paint balls, which are brightly colored psychedelic. But she was collecting them like Easter eggs. And at the end of the day, she had a whole half of a box. So it was a good event for all of us. What did your mom think of paintball? I think she just was thrilled that her grandson was on the winning team. Yeah. So where does Trevor live? Does he live with you? He, he lives in the Bay Area in Morgan Hill with his dad. So I, I see him rather infrequently, but it's always, it's really wonderful to see him. And the great thing is there's 10 years between his sister and him, and him. So I think that he always likes seeing her. She always likes seeing him. And it probably helps that she is just super athletic and I always have a story about what her latest exploit is. So it's probably easier for him as a brother to have a sister that's kind of a tomboy rather than a real prissy girl. But they get along and hang out together. And they get along. Clarissa is always trying to roughhouse or they'll like play a little bit of soccer or frisbee. It's whatever is around. Yes, they'll do it together. So um, what's your life like right now? What do you do during the day? What are, what are some of your hobbies? Well, I'm really fortunate. I live down here in Midtown, so I can walk to many places. And I like to design and make jewelry. It came about by a rather... Um, It wasn't intentional. I, I also ballroom dance, so I like really dangly big earrings. And so I was making earrings for myself, and then people said, wow, could you make me some? And I started making them and taking them to work. And then someone said, why don't you come out on second Saturday and have your things out? So I got a tax ID number because one of my daughter's schools was having a an arts and crafts festival and you had to get a tax ID and I did that and then one thing led to another and so now I have my things out every sa second Saturday and um, another ballroom dancer who's a fabulous art glass worker her name is Sandy Fetter she asked me if I would design necklaces using her wonderful dichroic glass pendants and I said sure I'd be honored so we have a collaborative effort going and that's my creative outlet and then my ballroom dancing I do ballroom and Latin and it's fantastic it's a nice gentle workout it does allow for some creativity and playfulness um, so a little bit of socialization and you get to dress up in very nice outfits. It's very, very nice in that way. And I also, I ski a little bit. I've taken Clarissa skiing. It's very important to me uh, to have her involved with things outdoors, the fresh air, the nature. And just miraculously, this weekend, we found out we have a community garden plot, so we're going to be working on that. We just started this weekend, so that's definitely going to be one of my hobbies. And I don't, I never thought of them really as hobbies, but it's yeah, a pastime. It's just your passions, and mm -hmm. it sounds like you're very busy. Mm -hmm. Um, When you think just on your life so far, what has been your happiest moment or moments? Well, when I had my son, I had him by uh, C-section after a kind of a long labor. And with my 
daughter, I was really determined that I would try and have her by a natural method. So I had hired a doula to help with my labor and she came and she took my blood pressure at various times and got acquainted with me before Clarissa was, you know, probably weeks before she was due. And the reason I wanted that is that I knew if I went into the hospital and my, if my labor didn't progress at a certain rate that they would probably want me to get on that C-section bandwagon and I didn't want that to happen. And yet I wanted to be responsible about having someone knowledgeable helping me through the laboring process. So the best answer seemed to be to hire this woman who was actually, had been a midwife in Texas and she was not yet licensed here and so I just hired her in the doula role. And she really helped me. Um, she came and labored at the at the home at our home and in a big tub I was laboring there and she knew when it was time to go to the hospital and we went it was perfect timing it was actually just time for me to push and I had Clarissa within two hours and 45 minutes which seemed like a long time but I was just so happy that I had Clarissa without having to have the c-section without having to have medication on board she was born she was a kind of blue but they gave her the little sectioning and brought her over she started nursing like a champion unbelievable just she's such an amazing child and she's I, I don't know if that would have been the happiest moment, but that was a very, that was a, a big high moment. And just seeing her progress has been an absolute joy. And it turns out she is becoming quite an, a little athlete. Um, to give you a for instance, when Well, she she started doing soccer, and she when she's out there running around, it's like a flame. She has kind of light blonde hair, and it flies up in the air, and she is so capable. She can run fast, and she doesn't seem to run out of energy. So on her first season, her, it was a co-ed a co-ed team and the coach said that Clarissa she's got the fire in her belly and it was kind of amazing because I had been a little worried that when Clarissa got out there she might be intimidated well I had nothing to worry about at all she just never ever backed down one inch from anyone regardless of how tall they were or how much bigger they were she just goes for it and so she's now played two more years and she goes out there and makes goals and she's learned how to do the the kick the goal kicks and her dad works with her quite a bit so she has her own personal coach in that regard and at some point she decided she liked swimming and so she's been on swim team two years at McKinley Park, which is one of the most beautiful parks here in Sacramento. And the first year she got DQ'd a few times, and but she worked hard. The second year she worked even harder, and it came down to the championships. And at the championship pool, we had eight lanes, and the best lanes are lanes four and five. And Clarissa ended up on the, on the preliminaries. She was swimming in lane four, 
I happen to be the one of the officiants in lane six. And so I knew what the times were for the other the other participants, in particular Tanya Tomas, who is a big competitor to Clarissa. And in fact, her time was 5.03, and Clarissa's was, I can't remember Clarissa's, but I do know this. It was probably 10 seconds more than Tanya's. But in the preliminary heat, Clarissa went in the pool, and she got so far ahead of the other swimmers, I was able to run over to her lane and yell in encouragement to go, go, go. She came out of the water in one minute and 49 seconds, which had beaten the time of Tanya. So it was so thrilling. It just was like an incredible. And we were all jumping up and down. And then, then the afternoon, though, would be the finals. And Tanya went and swam, and she bettered her time by four or five seconds. Clarissa had bettered hers by 11 seconds. So it was the afternoon, and Tanya was in lane five. Clarissa was in lane four, the two best lanes. And by this time, I was no longer an official. I was a, I was a spectator. And those two girls went in the water, and they did that butterfly stroke, which appeared to be stroke for stroke even the whole lap they came back backstroke one stroke stroke for stroke dead even they did their backstroke it was completely even we're just going crazy I'm surprised no one had a heart attack and on the last lap coming home on her freestyle Tanya either ran out of gas or Clarissa poured it on but she won by at least four feet oh wow and she got um a one minute 50 second point three and, and change so she won the girls 100 yard i am with girls eight and under in sacramento and she did it as a seven-year-old so this year she's working on setting some records so what advice do you give her about winning and competition I say to her, honey, do your best. Recognizing that at times she probably will encounter someone that will be faster. And yet if, if you do your best at all, at all times, then you can walk away with your head up and knowing in your heart of hearts that you gave it your best shot. Um, so those are some of the happiest times of your life. What are some of the hardest times of your life? What have they been? Well, by far the hardest time was my son, Trevor, and um, my son, Trevor, was moved out of state and away um, from me when he was about four, uh, four or five. And I did everything I could. It's just a lot of kind of legal and social issues that got way out of control and it was a time of my life when I was distraught and cried rivers of tears for for being separated from my son at the same time I I feel that had I had any predisposition for a drug use or alcoholism that would have been the time because I was so distraught about the situation however I met um, a wonderful man named Tom who helped me learn a lot of outdoor activities and I literally would go ride my bike maybe 20 or 30 miles along the American River bike trail to just burn off some of the angst I had um, and I I actually gained skill and and it helped get me through that time. I, I really wanted to have a sport I could do with my son and so I learned how to mountain bike. I I went on trails such as 
the Salmon Falls Trail and the Clementine Loop up in Auburn, and it's single track uh, mountain biking. It's fantastic. I learned that in my 30s. And then um, I kept trying and trying to have more contact with my son. And I also, I well, I, I skied when I could. I learned um, cross-country skiing. Um, in some ways, I mean, it was bittersweet because I learned all these wonderful outdoor things and how I realized how capable I could be physically. And yet I still didn't have as much contact with my son as I wanted. And now at 18, um, we do speak really frequently and we talk about things. He asks my advice on things and I think we're, we're well on our way to kind of mending that time that was so difficult. There's just a few minutes left, but um, what are your hopes for the next few years? What are your goals? Well, I, I didn't mention also that I, I like to sing, and I would like to sing more, perhaps learn some more art, like painting or drawing. I, I'm not sure which. I, I think I, I have a more artistic expression that could come out. So I'd like to do more in that regard. I'd like to get a better job um, that was more challenging for me and also would provide better uh, income for myself and Clarissa. And um, perhaps it would be really wonderful. <coughs> Kazinta, it would be really wonderful to have a, uh, a, a good relationship maybe even a marriage it would be a very positive thing yeah well there's probably just one minute left but you said before we started the interview that you had been doing some dating with match.com mm -hmm. have you had do you have any um notable stories from that experience oh i do but it's more than a minute worth <laughs> all right <laughs> I wish you all the luck in that. And thank you so much for coming and sharing your stories today. Oh, you're so welcome.